Hey, what happened to that hack janitor Joey? Wasn't he supposed to finish Anime 17? We're already a week into June. You can't have anime in June. Oh, can't you? The month of May may be over, but that doesn't mean we can't party like it still is. This is Summer Anime 17, and I won't stop until we cover all 31 shows and movies that I had planned, so let's get back into it. Can I steal you away? Will you accept this Anime 17, your daily dose of anime every day in May? It's the 1994 sci-fi rom-com DNA Squared. When you're ready. Have you ever felt love at first sight? That gnawing pain when you feel inexplicably drawn to a person you've never met? Perhaps this feeling lies in our molecular makeup, and our bodies can sense compatible genes without us even realizing, or maybe that's just a bunch of sci-fi mumbo-jumbo, but it is the premise of DNA Squared. Now, don't ask me what the squared is about, my best guess is that it's talking about two individuals' DNA connecting, and which case wouldn't you add instead of multiply? This is a bit of a harem show juggling four love interests, but I'm getting ahead of myself. In the future, overpopulation has reached critical levels, and having too many children is punishable by death. The problem can be traced back to the man referred to as Megaplay, a prolific playboy who bared a hundred boys who each grew up to bear another hundred children, and so on. So, a time-traveling officer named Karen is tasked with finding and altering the DNA of the Megaplayboy to prevent this surplus of playboys in the present. Pretty wacky concept, but I kind of appreciate a fantastical explanation as to why our protagonist attracts so many women, besides the fact that the story dictates it. Turns out our playboy extraordinaire Jinta is a complete loser who barfs his guts out whenever he gets close to a girl. Determined not to leave empty-handed, Karen injects the DNA mutant gen anyway and accidentally awakens Jinta's playboy instincts and inadvertently causes the entire conflict she was sent to prevent. Unable to control himself, Jinta now swaps back and forth between his nervous self and suave alter ego when in the presence of any girl. Without a way to change him back, Karen tries to hook Jinta up with his plain Jane childhood friend Ami in hopes that he may just settle down with her and not fully transform into Megaplay. The premise doesn't evolve much more than that for the opening half of the series, but what kept me invested more than typical harem-style shows were the fun sight gags and well-integrated fan service. First of all, harem anime refers to a romantic show with a single protagonist being pursued by multiple love interests. Usually three or four, but sometimes upwards of a dozen or more. There usually isn't a lot of time given to each individual love interest, and heavily relies on titillating the viewer. Thus, most harem shows utilize what's called fan service. Often a derogatory term, it refers to elements of a book or show that are intentionally included simply for the audience's pleasure. Things like lingering shots of sexy characters, or references and easter eggs. I don't believe these kinds of inclusions are outright bad or pandering, but used carelessly can feel pointless or distracting. DNA Squared features a lot of attractive young girls in compromising situations, which are certainly entertaining to the audience, but each are contextualized well in the story. Characters don't just fall over for no reason so the audience can see a panty shot. Characters are actively seducing the main character, and oftentimes the exchanges are excuses for Jinta to snap back to reality and fail to overcome his nervous tics. As you can see, the show weaves its fan service into the narrative and never breaks the scene just to tantalize the viewer. The premise is about Jinta getting turned on by a bunch of girls, so of course he's going to notice their form-fitting clothing or their cute expressions. And can I say, for a 90s anime with fairly simplistic art direction for today's standards, these character designs really stand up. I think a lot of their appeal stems from the stellar execution of the fan service, but these are some really sexy ladies. The 80s, 90s anime aesthetic is coming back in the vaporwave music movement, and I find that look appealing now when I really didn't ten years ago. Karen in particular stands out, even despite her pretty hideous getup. Her performance is the most varied, and she's definitely the most expressive of the bunch. But it's kind of strange how no one questions her presence. She comes in out of nowhere in a deflatable spacesuit, rides a hover cycle, and basically breaks and enters everyone's house, and they're all like, that's Karen for ya. Junta's okay, but he looks like a Yu-Gi-Oh cosplayer, and his Playboy persona looks like a big, drooling baby. And that's another thing, the characters don't really stay on model very consistently, which is common for its time, but I'm not a huge fan of the scrunched-up faces, particularly the mouths of some of these girls. One moment, Ami is the cutest girl in the scene, and later her face is tectonically shifted into an unrecognizable blob. The characters look good when it counts, so I wasn't too put off by the animation. As to be expected with a cheap 90s anime, the English localization got hit with a pretty shoddy dub. If it weren't for Misty's voice actress, Rachel Lillis, I wouldn't have anything positive to say about it. The commercial break in the middle of each episode also sounds exactly like the Mission Complete jingle from the Metal Slug series. Mission Complete! 
Karen even kind of reminds me a little of Eri Kasamoto from those games. Besides each episode being filled with a lineup of girls coming out to Jinta, there really wasn't a whole lot else going on, but that didn't stop me from wanting to keep watching. The moment I started to reconsider was in episode 6 when Ami's friend Katomi goes on a date with Jinta. His alter ego kicks in and acts like a real creep. Up to this point, when Jinta transforms into the playboy, he's always a perfect gentleman who always has the perfect compliments, but never leads the girls on. He's chivalrous and protects the girls' honor. Oh yeah, and there's this scene where some hired thugs rip off Tamako's clothes in a crowded cafe and Jinta kicks their asses. So yeah, the fan service isn't always well integrated, but regardless, in this scene, Jinta pulls Kotomi aside when she suggests spending a romantic stay at a love hotel. But instead of just reassuring her that they don't have to do something like that, he goes in for a kiss, grabs her butt, and teases her for being nervous. Previously, it had been established that like Jinta's vomiting, Kotomi has uncontrollable gas when she's around boys she likes. That's been her defining trait up until now. And the dude gets up in her ear and is like, Hey babe, you gonna fart? Fart for me. Obviously it's not like that, but that's what it felt like. He immediately snaps back and we don't get to see where Megaplay was going with all of this. So, by the midway point, I'm already a little tired of the formula of a bunch of flirtatious scenes ending with Jinta getting embarrassed and throwing up. The conceit that Jinta has this condition to violently vomit purple goo whenever he's aroused is just so insane. It's honestly more baffling than the whole DNA alter ego compatibility thing. DNA Squared is a pretty entertaining and good looking show for what it is. It's got probably the best looking characters in TV anime from this period, at least from what I've seen. I should stress that the show is strictly PG-13 and a pretty tame one at that. If you think the girls look cute like I do, then you'll inevitably get wrapped up in the romantic drama and get a fair bit of enjoyment out of the series. If the show isn't turning heads, then there must be something wrong with your genes. Until next time, anime fans, stay beautiful. <laughs>